Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at risk premium, risk aversion, and the Sharpie ratio. These th three topics are interrelated, so it's very important to cover them all three together. This topic is covered on the CFA exam as well as an essentials or principles of investment course. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance, as well as Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them share them put them in playlist if they benefit you it means they might benefit other people share the wealth and connect with me on instagram on my website farhatlectures.com you will find additional resources to supplement and complement your course as, as this course as well as your cpa cfa cma exam as well as your other accounting courses i strongly check suggest you check out my website we're going to start by looking at risk premium. How do we measure risk premium? So I want you to keep this relationship in mind, which is a relationship that makes sense, and I hope it makes sense. Let's take a look at risk and return. This is risk on the x-axis, and we're going to look at the return at the y-axis. So if I ask you, if you take no risk, do you expect any return? In other words, if you sit home and you don't do anything in your life, should you earn anything? And the answer is no. You're not risking anything. So if you have, let's assume, a thousand dollar, and that thousand dollar is in your mattress, what are you risking? Nothing. Nothing. Therefore, you should not earn anything. Now, what can you do? Well, what you can do is you can take this one thousand dollar and take it to the bank or buy t-bills with it and you're going to see why i'm i said t-bills short-term treasury bill well if that's if that's the case you're really still not taking any risk whether you have that money in the bank or if you bought a treasury bill basically your risk is zero but you might make maybe i'm just going to say two percent so if you invest this money you are still take, taking no risk and you'll be up at two percent here so risk is zero you earn two percent now here's what happened your friend might come to you and he or she might tell you, look, I have this business idea. Do you want to invest with me? Well, guess what? That business idea will carry risk. Or you might want to invest this money in the stock market. Or you want to buy real estate. Or you want to buy gold. So here's what's going to happen. As you steer away from the bank and from treas by treasury bill, which is once you steer away from safety, okay, so once you start to take more risk, okay, What's going to happen as you take more risk, logically speaking, you want to earn a higher return. So let's assume you, your friend wants you invest, you want to invest your money with your friend. Well, you don't know much about his or her business, but you want to earn to be on the safe side. You're taking more risk. As you take more risk, you may want to earn 10%. 10%. So your risk is here and 10% is here. Or you might want to buy a, uh, a a stock with a uh, with a drug that's unproven yet so a drug under fda approval well you're taking more risk because it's under fda approval as you take more risk you expect to be compensated maybe at 15 percent at 15 percent you'll be compensated here so here's what happened here's the, here's the relationship that i want you to keep in mind as you take more risk you expect more return so risk and return if if risk goes up if risk goes up, if you take more risk, you expect to be compensated. And I hope this basic idea makes sense to you because this basic idea is very important for this session. So this is the basic idea behind this session. So the first thing we're going to talk about and define is something called risk premium. And what is the risk premium? It's the difference between the expected holding period return, HPR, on an index fund and the risk-free treasury bill that you earn with certainty. So if you put your money with the government in a short-term treasury bill, you might earn, let's assume this is 2%. Well, this is risk-free because you're really taking no risk. You're going to earn this, this, this percentage. But if you invest your money in the stock market, you might earn in the stock market 10%. So this whole thing is 10%. Now, guess what? The risk premium the risk premium you are taking is, let me use a different color here. The risk premium you are taking is 8%. So the difference between 
your expected return, your expected holding period return, which is 10%, and your risk-free guarantee rate is your risk premium. So by undertaking this investment, you are you are getting a risk premium of 8% because if you don't want to, you can make guarantee 2%. So if the risk-free rate in, in, the, in the example is 4% and the expected index fund return is 10%, so basically, let me just show it to you here in boxes. So this is the treasury bill will give you 4%, but if you invest in, 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 in the index stocks, you're going to make in total in total, 10%. Therefore, the extra 6% is the risk premium, is the risk premium. So I just want to make sure you understand this idea because we're, this is a powerful idea. Another term that we use is access return, which is the return and access of the risk-free rate. So anything you earn above the risk-free rate, which is we're going to be using the risk-free rate, treasury bill, short-term treasury bill, is called access return. So simply put, for uh, for my purposes, you could use the access return and risk premium interchangeably. Now, from the risk premium, we're going to talk about risk aversion. What is the risk aversion? Risk aversion is the reluctance to accept risk. As individual, we are risk averse. In other words, we try to avoid risk as much as possible. If we want to take risk, remember, remember, if we want to take more risk, what do we expect? We expect to earn a higher return. So yes, if we're gonna take risk, we're gonna we're gonna expect a higher return. But generally speaking, we can say we are risk re reluctant. Okay, we re we reluctant to accept risk. So risk risk aversion is the degree to which investors are willing to commit funds to stocks depending on the risk aversion. How much you're gonna invest in stocks? What I mean by stocks, risky investment. It doesn't have to be stocks. It can be real estate. It can be your friend asking you to asking you to invest in their in their new invention. That's that's that that's risk. It all depends on your risk aversion. Investors are risk averse in a sense that without positive premium, risk premium, they would not be willing to invest invest in stocks. So what is risk premium? Positive risk premium. Positive risk premium is that extra above the treasury bill rate. Above, you remember the four percent treasury bill. You only would accept risk if they can if you are compensated for this extra premium. So in theory. Okay, there must be always a positive risk premium on risky asset in order to induce risk averse investors to hold the existing supply of the asset. Otherwise, you are a gambler. Think about it. If you don't believe risk and return comes hand in hand, why would you invest? Well, the reason you would invest is because you are a gambler. So simply put, you would always you want to have you want to have that extra risk premium. So again, I'm gonna, I do this several times, but there's a reason for it. So if the treasury bill is paying 4% for you to own the stocks, you, you, you should expect a return of 10, which is an extra 6%. So you would only take the extra risk only if the expected return is higher. Otherwise, we will not take that risk. Okay, now to determine an investor optimal portfolio strategy, we need to quantify, we need to put a number on that risk, on the degree of risk aversion. So we need to measure the degree of risk aversion. So an obvious benchmark is a risk-free asset. So basically we look at the risk-free assets, which neither have volatility nor have risk premium. So if you invest in risk-free asset, what is your risk? You have no risk whatsoever. Why? Because the risk-free asset like the treasury bill or a CD in the bank, CD in the bank has no no risk premium and it doesn't have any volatility. So it pays it pays a certain rate of return if it's a risk-free R and F risk-free. Risk-averse investor will not hold risky asset without the prospect of earning some premium above risk-free rate. Again, back to this idea that you only invest you only invest if the return is worth is is if is the return is above the risk free rate that's the only that's the only reason we infer higher risk aversion if we have demanded higher risk premium for any given level of risk well what does that mean it means if i want to take more risk i want more return that's basically what it means i want a higher risk premium i want a higher risk premium now we're going to measure this exactly how we measure this this risk an individual degree of risk aversion can be inferred by contrasting two things we're going to look at the risk premium on the investor's entire wealth so his complete portfolio let's assume you know his complete portfolio against the variance of the portfolio so simply put we're going to have we're going to take the risk free at uh, the risk premium risk premium which is the expected return minus the risk free divide this by the variance and that's how we measure 
That's how we measure the risk aversion. So the ratio of risk premium to variance. Risk premium to variance means divided by the variance measures the reward demanded per unit or per unit of volatility. So for example, if an investor whose entire wealth has been invested in portfolio Q with an annual risk premium of 10%, so that's the numerator, 10% is the numerator, and a variance of 0 0.256, 0 0.0256, not 0 0.256, 0 0.2056, the standard deviation is 16. We're, we're not dealing with the standard deviation for now. What's going to happen is you're going to have a risk, uh, a risk aversion, or A, risk aversion equal to 3.91, which is the risk premium, which is the expected rate of return minus the risk free rate. We're not giving the detail, which is basically given the numerator is 10%. The denominator is the variance. And be careful, it's the variance, not the standard deviation, because we're going to look at the standard deviation in a moment. So we call this ratio here, risk premium to its variance, the price of risk or market price risk. So this is how we price the risk. And this is important. So based on this price, price of this risk, we would allocate wealth between risky and risk-free, <coughs> sorry, and risk-free assets. And we're going to see later on when we start to put a portfolio together. And this is, <coughs> I'm sorry, when we start, when we start to put to start to put a portfolio together, we want to know what's the price of risk, and based on that, we will determine the allocation. Also, in the real world, when you when you are dealing with a client, in the real world, when you're dealing with a client, the first thing is you want to know what's their how how much risk do they tolerate. If they tolerate a lot of risk, well, you're going to have more risky investment than risk-free asset. If they don't tolerate a lot of risk, then we're going to have less risky asset. Now, what does that 3.91 mean? Just give me one second. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss this in a moment with another example right now. Assume, how do you interpret it? That's what I'm trying to say. Assume a complete portfolio represented by the stock market index, such as S&P. So let's assume we have a portfolio that's representing the S&P 500, call it M. The average access return, which is the risk premium on the market is 0 0.08. So this is the numerator. And the variance is 0 0.04. Let's compute the risk aversion or uh, the risk aversion. Well, it's it's uh, the, or, or the price of risk. If we take 0 0.08 divided by the variance equal to two. Now remember, in the prior example, we had 3.91, now we had two. So what, the, what does these numbers mean? Let me just tell you in general, what do they do? Then we'll change the numbers a little bit for it to make sense. Conventional wisdom holds that a plausible estimate for the value of the price of risk A lie in the range of negative five to four. What does that mean? Let me just kind of quick do a quick ca computation here and show you what it means. Um, so this way you'll have an idea how does the price of risk affect the risk premium as well as the variance in the portfolio. How does the variance affect the risk premium? So let's assume the same the same information except that our risk premium is 10 percent 0.1 so let's compute if we take 0.1 divided by 0 0.04 variance not 0 0.4 0 0.04 that's going to give us an a of 2.5 now let me just so it's point let me let's compare them hand in hand so we we change the risk premium to 0.1 the variance is 0 0.04. That will give us an answer of 2.5. If you have a choice between those two portfolios, which portfolio will you choose? Of course, I will choose this portfolio right here. Why? Because I am getting more uh, premium, more return. I'm taking more risk without changing my, without changing my variance, without changing my this dispersion. Therefore, 2.5, I'll prefer a portfolio of 2.5. And let's let's change this. Let's assume it's 0.08. I'm earning 8%, but my volatility is 0.0. I made let's make it 0 0.08 to make the math easy. 0 0.08 divided by 0 0.08 is one. Here's what's happening is I am I am I'm, my risk premium is 8%, but I'm I am I am experiencing a lot of volatility in my portfolio. Therefore, I will prefer this portfolio over this portfolio. So hopefully it starts to make sense when we measure the the when we measure this 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 ratio the price of risk now hopefully it make more sense so this this is pretty good this this is good but again you have to kind of look at it in perspective you have to look at it in perspective another similar ratio is the sharpie ratio the sharpie is the person that created the ratio william sharpie now what we're going to be looking at is the 
it's pretty similar. And you're going to see it's the ratio of portfolio risk premium to the standard deviation, not, not, not to the variance, to the standard deviation. So risk aversion, what we just looked at, implied that investors will demand a higher reward to accept a higher portfolio volatility. We, I just showed you this. Well, same thing. I mean, all we have to know is if we have a portfolio a risk premium, we can divide this by the standard deviation of the portfolio access return. So rather than the variance, we're going to divide it by the standard deviation. That's all what it is. A risk-free asset will have zero premium and a zero standard deviation because when we're dealing with risky free assets, they have no deviation. They have no risk. There is no risk premium. So a, a risk-free asset, this is the risk-free asset. Risk-free asset is basically, it does not have any, it does not have any standard deviation. Therefore, the Sharpie ratio of risky portfolio quantify, we're going to kind of quantify the incremental reward, the additional reward, okay, the additional reward for each increase in 1% of the standard portfolio deviation. Well, in other words, as we increase the standard deviation, how much are we getting in reward? I mean, the best way to, to kind of explain this, let me just show you kind of, let me just kind of look at certain graphs and just kind of ask you a few questions and hopefully the Sharpie ratio will make, will make, uh, will make more sense. This is uh, earning 10% and we have, this is stock A and this is stock B. Stock B is also earning 20%. And this is the deviation. Those are the deviation here. It goes up, it goes down. There is the deviation. If you choose between A and B, which, st which stock would you take? Definitely will take B. Why? Because the risk, notice it's almost the same. The deviation is the same. It goes up and down, but the return is higher. So guess what? I am I am making more return with less risk. I'm earning 20% and basically those two are the same risk. Let me show you another. Let's assume A and B. Let's assume this is stock A will earn 10%. This is stock A and this is, let me do a different color, stock B. And let's look at stock B. Stock B also earns 10%. If you are presented with those two stocks, which stock would you prefer? Well, I'll prefer stock A. Why? Because with the same level, with less risk, I'm earning 10%. Notice stock B the, in the red one has more risk. That does that make sense. So you don't want stock, you don't want stock B because stock B is riskier. Stock B has more risk. And what am I being compensated? I'm not being compensated. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm making 10% at the end. So I may end up with, you know, maybe 5%. I don't know. Or I may end up with 20%, but I am taking risk. I don't want to, I don't want to take that risk. If I can make 10% with no risk, it's better. Okay. Let's look at a third, third scenario just to kind of show you what this Sharpie ratio trying to measure. Let's assume I, I can make 10% with this. Let me just a little bit of, a little bit of fluctuation. 10% with this stocks, or I can make 11% with another stock. So this is so this is stock A, this is stock B. Now you need to ask yourself: I have an additional 1%. Is it worth taking this? Is it worth taking all this risk for the additional 1%? So this is what the Sharpie ratio trying to measure: the relationship between your risk premium, your portfolio of risk premium to your standard deviation. And what do I mean by standard deviation? The standard deviation is the fluctuation, is the fluctuation in the stock. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. The Sharpie ratio of a portfolio with an annual risk premium of 8% and a standard deviation of 20. So in the numerator, we're going to have the 8% uh, 0.08 and, and standard deviation of 0.2, 20% will give us a Sharpie ratio of 0.4 or 40%. What does that mean? A higher Sharpie ratio indicate a better reward per unit of standard deviation. Of course it does. Let me show you why. Let me show you why. So we have 0.08 divided by 20 gave us 0.4. Let's assume I want I want if I want to get to a higher ratio. If I if I'm making 10%, you uh, making the same. Uh, using the same standard deviation, the same risk, 0.2, my ratio equal to 0.5. So 0.5, I'm making more return given the same risk of 20%. So this is what the Sharpie ratio 
will measure for us. So it's 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 very similar to the risk aversion, very similar, but it's just kind of basically looking at something else. So the standard deviation, I just want to make sure you are aware of this, is useful risk measure for diversified portfolio. It's not for individual securities. When we compute the standard deviation, it's for the portfolio. And the Sharpie ratio is a valid statistic for ranking portfolios in terms of in terms of risk premium and standard deviation. It's not appropriate to, to use it to look at individual assets. You just want to make sure you understand the, uh, the limitation of those. In the next session, what I would do, I would work an example illustrating how to compute the risk aversion and Sharpie ratio hand in hand because it's very important after you learn the concept to kind of practice an exercise to see how this works. As always, I'm going to ask you to like and share this recording if you like it. And don't forget to visit my website, farhatlectures.com, to look at additional resources for this course as well as your other resources uh, as well as your other courses or if you're studying for cpa cfa or cma exam good luck study hard and stay safe